Hey everyone, welcome to our second lecture. This one's gonna be a little bit shorter um, just because the documentation for this um, and the sources are relatively limited. Um, quite a few primary documents were destroyed. Um, and, it, and it makes sense when the atrocities um, that were enacted against the Tasman First Nation or Aboriginal population, um, when they started to be revealed, the British government very quickly um, eliminated those documents. <laughs> so the sources I pulled from when I studied this initially um, was from newspaper articles that still existed and historians who had gotten their hands on primary documents before they were destroyed. Um, so, Australia is a very interesting place to discuss in terms of its um, relationship with the Commonwealth because it was initially established as a penal colony. I am sure quite a few of you are familiar with um, what, what that means, but let me just give you a brief background. Um, so, Folks uh, in Britain who committed a series of 19 different crimes um, were sent to Australia um, as convicts to um, colonize this new land. So Australia, upon um, James Cook, who was one of the initial British explorers to um, have stumbled upon it, they really didn't see a whole lot. Um, so the first fleet that occurred in 1788 uh, landed in New South Wales, which is just outside of Sydney, um, or like New South Wales is the state in which Sydney is in. Um, and they didn't think the country had a whole lot of wealth attached to it. Obviously, we know now that that is very incorrect. <laughs> um, for lots of different reasons, Australia can be fairly self-sustaining. Um, you know, geographically, the land mass is, is the equivalent of the continental United States. And then you have Tasmania, which is um, south of Australia. It is separate, much like Hawaii is, um, but it, it's larger than Hawaii. So, Australia, a place very near and dear to my heart. If you don't know, I lived there um, for a year, um, quite some time ago in another lifetime, but we still have family and friends there and it's very important to me. So it was kind of what piqued my interest initially in studying Australia and Britain's involvement, um, with establishing Australia, despite the fact that the First Nation population had been there for thousands of years <laughs> and like living relatively peacefully, um, yes, in this beautiful country. So. James Cook, I'm sure lots of you have heard of him. Um, pretty interesting guy. He was an explorer who circumnavigated the globe quite a few times. Um, on his initial trip to the South Pacific, when he, um, we'll say discovered in quotation marks, uh, Australia, he spent quite a lot of time actually in New Zealand, um, about six months there upon his initial contact with those two countries and loved it so much that he decided to go back. Uh, when he first hit land um, in Tasmania in 1777, he did encounter the Aboriginal population and he described them as shy, meek, and kind, and that the British government um, should en enact a policy of just seek and discover and not necessarily destroy or colonize. Uh, obviously, they did not listen to his advice, but James Cook, um, quite honestly, is um, awful in his own right, despite what he wrote about Tasmania. Um, and among his other British peers, he was pretty unique in his um, assessment of the Aboriginal population. The Brits thought they were, by and large, um, and these are quotes, ugly, dirty, disgusting. Um, their skin was an unpleasant color. They uh, were naked and that was an affront to their British sensibilities. So much like our indigenous population here in the States, 
the First Nation population of Australia was viewed um, similarly. Similarly. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, so just going through my notes here. Um, so the British initially treated Australia um, as a terra nullis. In Greek, that means unowned land. So they did not acknowledge the Aboriginal uh, claim to that land at all because the Aboriginal population existed by and large like our indigenous population um, and smaller tribes. Um, some of them were nomadic. They just assumed that meant that they didn't have any claim to the land, which um, as we know is just really not the case. So um, the first fleet, 1788 folks uh, about 1,500 men, women, and children landed in New South Wales to establish the very first penal colony. Uh, lots of stuff to unpack there, but we can maybe save that for another lecture because that's not the focus of this one. Um, so, in 1803, so about, I don't know, 15 years later or so, the first penal colony was established in Tasmania. Uh, initially, the convicts that were left there, and that's how we're going to refer to them, um, that were left in Tasmania were by and large forgotten by the British Crown. They were forgotten by their government. They were left with supplies, but only to get them so far. So the Aboriginal population of Tasmania was very wary of the convict or the penal colony that existed. Um, and the two of them, the two groups often, you know, butted heads, we'll say, initially. Um, some of the Aboriginal population decided to help some of the uh, penal colony members, um, but after a bit of time, the folks that were left there decided to take matters into their own hands. Um, some folks left the colony or the small settlement and they became what's known as a bush ranger. Uh, a bush ranger is basically an individual who wanted to live off the land um, which in and of itself is not inherently violent, but these individuals were nasty. So they would often, um, engage in violence against the Aboriginal population. They would steal their livestock. They would rape their women. They would murder their children. Um, do some pretty horrific things. One account, uh, this is a trigger warning. If any of this information is sensitive to you, um, please fast forward um, about 30 seconds, I guess, uh, from here. One of the accounts I read was of a bush ranger who encountered a family, murdered the husband, and then made the wife, so the Aboriginal um, First Nation folks, made the wife walk around with her husband's head around her neck for a week while he reportedly um, raped her, abused her, and then murdered her as well. Um, horrific stuff, like just absolutely atrocious. And there was nobody to keep this in check. Uh, so the penal colony began encroaching on the Tasman land. The Aboriginal population uh, began stealing livestock and other goods and supplies as retaliation, um, and it just kept going. Um, and there was nobody there to really interfere um, in a negative or a positive way. So in 1817, so 14 years later, the British Crown began issuing land grants, expanding the penal colony. So from the initial little spot, um, they gave land grants that continued to encroach on the First Nation territory. The territory that wasn't necessarily assured to the First Nation population. However, um, based on the documents that I studied, that it wasn't as worrisome initially because they still had quite a bit of territory to themselves. But now these land grants just continued to push them out. Um, and more violence continued to occur. Um, in 1826, so almost a decade later, after you know continual violence, um, the newspapers began encroaching, or not encroaching, but um, producing just horrific things. Uh, and this is why propaganda 
and what is printed is so important. And, and this continues to tie back to our current political climate um, and the fake news uh, issue is that when you continue to other somebody, when you continue to use derogatory language, hateful language, um, it's, it over time manipulates the population to believe one thing over another. And we have seen this throughout history. Um, you know, and I will mention some other examples uh, and other genocides where the governments um, use propaganda as a mechanism for genocide. So it's incredibly powerful. And I think that's why um, folks like myself recognize the danger um, at, at what's happening because we've seen it. There's precedent, right? There's historical and empirical evidence showing us the dangers of this, showing us the, the result. And, and we're kind of here in like these beginning stages. Um, yeah. So, uh, do, 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 do. okay. So let me reverse just for, um, a little bit. Um, after the land grants were established in 1817, 1819, one of the um, lieutenant governors of the Australia occupation, um, we'll say, issued a procl proclamation instructing strict avoidance of the indigenous population, um, a strict forbearance of acts of hostility, and to avoid taking their children unless a child was found to be in a state of need. This is a big one. Um, this is a big one for lots of reasons. So this could be a whole another lecture. This could be a whole another class, to be honest with you. Um, this is something that happened with our own indigenous population and the indigenous population of Australia. Children were taken often by Christian missionaries. Um, they were taken from their families because their families were not deemed fit or worthy enough of taking care of them because they were different, right? They, there is no evidence to support an indigenous child being treated any better or worse than, than any other child. Um, but these Christian missionaries would come in and they would forcibly remove the children from their home. They would strip them of their Aboriginal and indigenous identity and raise them as a white person. Um, and so the lost children is, is a huge thing in Australia. It is something that they're still coming to terms with. Uh, it's heartbreaking that people were just coming in and, and removing these children um, by force because they were deemed to be in a state of need. Um, this ambiguous language is pretty common because it opens the door for interpretation. And as we all know, um, racism will use anything and everything to kind of get its way. So, uh, let's see. Um, okay, again, 1826, we're gonna go back. Um, Bold Face Proclamation was printed in the local colonial times, suggesting that the various nearby islands, and this is a direct quote, might make good reserves where Aborigines might acquire some slight habits of industry, which is the first step to civilization, or to die out slowly and far enough away as to not bother the settlers. And again, in the same newspaper, later in 1826, until Aborigines are sent out of this land, there will be continued slaughter. December 1st, 1826, the Colonial Times once again suggested what was going to happen, claiming self-defense is the first law of nature. The government must move the natives. If not, they will be hunted down like the wild beasts that they are and destroyed. Huge, huge. Dehumanizing that population right off the bat. Um, not right off the bat, this has been going on for 20 years <laughs> at, at this time, but this language is important, this language matters. Um, if any of these penal colony folks who have now, you know, had at least a generation's worth of folks, um, you know, live within this, this territory, now you're raising like the next round of folks and this is how they're growing up. This is how they're being raised to view this First Nation population, um, and I'm using Aboriginal and First Nation interchangeably, if you hadn't figured this out 15 minutes in, um, they are viewing this like indigenous population 
as wild beasts, as dogs, as like something to hunt. Like this inflammatory language um, had catastrophic results. Um, so 1828, martial law was declared in Tasmania against the indigenous population. Um, the Tasmanian Aboriginals refused to leave. Um, it was their home. They had been there for thousands of years. Why, you know, why would they want to leave? Um, so what began happening was as they continued to push them out of their land, they would continue to take their animals, their livestock, their children, their resources to the point where they had nothing left on their only option was for them to leave. So the Australians noted that there were some islands nearby, the Bass Island Straits. They told the Aboriginal population, if you leave peacefully, we will send you there. We will drop you off with supplies. You will be good. We'll have our space. You'll have your space. Great. Um, and so Aboriginals um, had, had little to no choice. Stay and be slaughtered or leave and, and at least have a hope of um, continuing to flourish. Um, or I guess maybe just survive, right? Instead of flourish. Flourish is not the correct word here. Um, so they did not have, the British did not have near enough provisions to provide the Aboriginal population. The population, um, that was sent to the islands, um, the population diminished nearly 70% because of malnourishment, violence, and disease. And here's the kicker. The last full-blooded Tasmanian Aboriginal, Truganini is, is her name, died in 1876. And in 1876, the Tasman um, Aboriginal population was declared extinct. So that was a lot. It was longer than I thought it would be. Um, horrific. They came in, they spread like a disease. They kicked them out to uh, an island that didn't have near the resources that Tasmania did, and they were left to die. That, that is what happened. And that is what happened um, in large portions of Australia. Australia is an interesting country because there's quite a bit of land um, that is really uninhabitable because of the degree of the climates, because of the severity. Um, the outback is a real thing and it is crazy hot. Um, but we can talk about that at another time because we're nearing um, 18 minutes, soon to be 19. So your homework um, for today is to do a quick Google search perusal of, of the lost children. Um, I'm not asking you to send me an essay or anything like that, just a couple sentences of what you discover, um, what is most shocking to you about the lost children. Um, yeah, so that's it. So this is the discussion on the Tasmanian Aboriginals. Uh, let me know what questions you have, concerns, comments, what have you. Um, I'm so glad you're here. Please, please continue um, to leave comments. I want this to be discussion-based. I want you to have your questions or leave your feedback um, or your responses um, to what it means. And I loved um, Blair and Jess. I love your comments on the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth is massive. My own personal experience with the Commonwealth um, is pretty unique. Uh, in the fact that um, my ex-partner was Australian and had a significantly easier time obtaining working visas in countries, in other Commonwealth countries than I did. Um, it took me six months to obtain a visa to work in Canada and it took her um, nothing. <laughs> like it, it literally happened within two days that she was able to obtain uh, a visa with no restrictions and mine was um, exceptionally restrictive. So interesting stuff here. So the next discussion will be on India, the East India Trading Company, and the Sepoy Rebellion. And I will provide another outline. Um, you know, if the outline I posted was helpful, please let me know. If you would like it to be more detailed, let me know. So that's all. Thanks.